Hi, I'm Mark. <laughs> all right. I'm Mark. Uh, do we want to go all lights, or people need to navigate and stuff, right? That's good. Really good. All right, all right, all right. Um, Is it more fun with all, all the lights out? <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of screenshots. But you know we'll uh, we'll we'll be good. All right, this is my this is my about me slide. This is professional and hobby affiliation. So mug makes the cut. I use I've used this background at other presentations and had the mug logo there. Proud to be a mug member, uh, and I should of course welcome you to the University of Winnipeg because I work here and that's my my day job. And I actually use overt the subject of today's presentation in my day job. And it's, uh, I specifically, I work, I'm a system in the library. And uh, the reason an overt installation ended up there in the first place is Adam. And uh, I'm glad I got introduced to it because I actually like overt. Um, and uh, that, he did that in 2013 and somehow it was still there in 2016 when I started. And, uh, but I've kept it, uh, I've actually uh, got it all patched up and taken care of. And, um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I've, I've been giving it love and uh, learning more about it, and uh, I think you guys might even get a second presentation out of me as I uh, kind of go go further with that. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about just sort of the underlying software stack that not what only... What is Overt? Okay, so <laughs> sure, we can start with that. Um, so Overt is a virtualization management platform that works at a data center scale, so or multiple data center scale. So um, everything else I'm going to kind of show you in the stack here, uh, when you just kind of use that stuff on its own, it really only works on one workstation, or they have a little bit of migration stuff, and you don't really get a full full view uh, through one kind of management interface. So um, over it is a platform from Red Hat, uh, and they call it Red Hat Virtualization if you buy support from them. Uh, that uh, yeah lets you do virtualization stuff on mass scale. So I'm just gonna we're gonna kind of build our way up to what what is overt build upon right. And also this is the stack that my laptop is running tonight to simulate an, an overt environment because normally overt is kind of enterprisey. You would use it in an environment where you actually had lots of different pieces of equipment, uh, multiple machines running virtual machines, multiple uh, st fancy storage equipment, that kind of thing. And, but today, on this uh, six-year-old laptop with only 16 gigs of RAM, we will, we will simulate the whole thing, and we will do that using, using um, the same, same stack of components. So and it'll be kind of uh, circular because we want to use nested KVM, which I will explain when we get there. So uh, lowest piece of the stack is uh, the kernel Linux, uh, which is been successful in many a domain, virtualization, one of them. One of the features that has uh, 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 done well in Linux in recent years is its KVM feature. And so KVM, uh, the idea behind KVM is that Linux itself can act as a hypervisor. And this is kind of in contrast to having some kind of dedicated operating system as a hypervisor. To remind people who might know, or let people who don't know, uh, a hypervisor is is a system that kind of runs your virtual machines. It's the thing that they're contained within that that you know allocates resources to them, and um, you know turns one computer into virtually multiple computers. So kernel virtuali virtualization is uh, that's what the KVM part is about, and so um, KVM is doing really well. Uh, originally, Amazon uh, built up their massive system on kind of the contrasting approach. They were using, why is the name something escaping me all of a sudden? Zen. They were using Zen. And so Zen, Zen's design approach is different. Zen has its own piece of software that runs on the bare metal and um, acts as a hypervisor. And then to actually use Zen, you have to have at least one guest operating system that takes on a whole bunch of responsibility anyway. And so Amazon has kind of given up on that, and they, they, are, they are adopting Linux and KVM to be, uh, to be their, their components in their stack. So uh, KVM provides a, um, a device node, I think it's dev KVM, that lets any sufficiently permissioned 
process and user space set up virtual machines. So for example, on my Ubuntu thing here, it's uh, if I'm in the libvirt group, devkvm has, uh, has that group uh, for having a, a rewrite execute access. And, um, and so any program that's uh, got access to that device node can, can use, consume the kernel, uh, consume Linux as a way to set up virtual machines. So QMU is the primary way uh, people do that uh, with KVM. And uh, QMU goes way back to before it was doing virtualization. It has a, an amazing <coughs> history uh, that's ongoing of doing emulation. The uh, difference between emulation and virtualization is with emulation, you have, say, a program like QMU that actually um, simulates an entire computer, including instruction execution. So, for example, we could use QMU to simulate a PowerPC computer on my Intel machine here. And that would be, that would be intensive, and Adam is right to say that wouldn't work very well. But um, people, people do do such things. Uh, these days, though, uh, instead of emulating all of the hardware all the way down to the CPU, people use QMU paired with KVM and Linux to set up uh, set up virtualization where, Adam, you want to jump in? You were saying about emulating PowerPC on an x86 machine, how crazy that would be, but if you have disks with byte order dependent data on them, okay. and your original machine is dead as a doornail, that is in fact a way to get the data off those disks. I had to do this to reconstruct the data off a dead RAID 5 appliance. So you're telling me that QMU's uh, hardware emulation capability saved your butt. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All I right. wish it hadn't. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's a magical program. Uh, and it, it does try to excel. When it does do that kind of emulation, it does try to accelerate things with like just-in-time optimizations and stuff where you actually you analyze the code paths as they execute, and you say, hey, is, which way do we usually go, and can we optimize based on that kind of thing? So, um, but yeah, the way QMU gets used in the virtualization context, which means it's not responsible for actually executing compute instructions. The, with virtualization, you have the ability to have a virtual machine that's the same architecture as its host machine, and for those instructions, uh, for the most of your routine instructions to be executed directly on the processor. And what your virtualization stack and your hardware virtualization extensions and your hypervisor all allows you to do is to kind of set that up and to give things their own, their, give every virtual machine its own memory space. So QMU consumes KVM to provide virtualization in uh, contemporary setups. Uh, and it can still do, it still has all that emulation capability of different peripherals that it kind of brought up with it. Because um, it didn't just emulate CPUs, it of course had to emulate everything else. Now, has anyone actually ever tried to execute? I'm going to let this person in. Mm -hmm. oh. Security. So uh, who here has ever actually tried to invoke QMU on the command line? <laughs> all right, and who found that to be a pain in the butt? <laughs> OK, all the same hands. So. Um, uh, typically, you want to have a front end on top of QMU, wh whether it's in a virtualization or an emulation context, that will help you invoke it and set it up. Because um, it has a lot of options in terms of am I emulating this? Am I passing through this device with uh, what's called VertIO? That's the ability to have uh, the guest operating system be aware that it's a guest that it, and that it's being hosted in a hypervisor, and to have network and disk IO, which are major bottlenecks. Uh, directly go to the hypervisor. QMU can set that up, uh, but it can also do emulation for uh, peripherals. And so, um, if you wanted to run a really ancient operating system an Intel, on an Intel processor that was designed for an Intel processor, maybe you would have to tell QMU, hey, uh, the, I need to actually emulate a hard drive and emulate a, a, uh, a network card. and QMU is going to take over and execute when those things are happening. Uh, ooh, and, the, and the operating system will be fooled that there's a real network card or a real hard drive. Whereas with the, um, with the VertIO stack, if you set it up that way, it assumes a guest operating system, that it's aware it's, it's a guest, that it's, in a that it's a virtual machine, that there's a hypervisor there. And, and then QMU can stay out of the way. 
Okay, so to make QMU easier, you need some kind of, you need a layer on top of that. So the layer that a lot of people are using is called Libvert. So here we go, we got penguins with sardines. Um, and then your typical Libvert setup will have a daemon called like the Libvert D. And uh, then you get just front ends. Uh, if you're just having a simple Libvert set, if you want just a simple Libvert setup, like I have on my laptop, uh, you can use uh, a GUI front end to the Libvert daemon like uh, Vert Dash Manager and VIRSH or Versh. And uh, nice thing about those clients for Libvert is they can actually be on a different machine and they can remote connect to a to a Libvert game and on another machine and they can even so you can you can actually use just a simple Libvert stack to mo manage multiple computers at the same time. But where I think you guys will find Overt maybe interesting is that it um, it can it's a little more handy for that. And uh, Libvert is used uh, by other uh, KVM based virtual virtualization stacks. Uh, Proxmox is one I've heard a lot of people talk about. I'll have to try it someday. Uh, and there's a whole list of a whole bunch of others on that uh, Linux KVM page. And actually, I'm not sure all of those actually use Libvert. Those are actually things that use KVM, so that's a slide error. But I'm, uh, the key thing is that Overt definitely uses Libvert under the surface. But yeah, Libvert does not only gives you the ability to connect these nice application front ends, but it also uh, it has things like um, configuration files describing the configuration of a virtual machine. That's all XML, whether you consider that a nightmare or a disaster, that's up to you. <laughs> I will offer no opinion, because I don't really go to that layer. Okay, on my laptop I'm running Ubuntu, and so the only really essential stuff other than a basic XORG stack that I have here is uh, when I install Vert-Manager um, that also on Ubuntu, that also includes the uh, if you allow recommended packages, that includes the libvert D. So uh, that's how easy it is to get a, a simple lib, libvert stack uh, on, on, a, on a single computer. And then uh, to integrate with what we're doing later, uh, vert-viewer is a helpful program as well. I'll, we will get to that one. And then the other bit of, as I said in the meeting description, secret sauce that we're going to have today is we're going to use nested KVM. So imagine this. My laptop is running Ubuntu. I've got a basic KVM QMU libvert stack. And inside of that, I'm going to run a virtual machine that's going to be running an overt hypervisor software, which is also KVM based. And so we're actually able to have virtualization, we're actually able to have a virtual machine on a laptop that itself can run virtual machines inside of it. So we will, we will see that emerge. So to do nested KVM, uh, you're gonna, you have to look at your individual platform for how to set that up. Some platforms, your KVM stack might already have it enabled or they might just have a checkbox or uh, on my Ubuntu install, I think I had to do this, I had to uh, edit a, uh, a mod probe related file for when the uh, Intel KVM module is loaded and nested one. And here's two ways to verify that that uh, kernel module parameter is set is actually correct. So if I wasn't ready for nested KVM today, we would have a no, we would have a no uh, on either of those. Do you connect via APIs? So uh, what about APIs? Do you use APIs to okay, so Libvert, yeah. Libvert is basic is an API, and then what we're going to discover today is that well, and in a sense, KVM is also a very low level API. Yeah. It KVM is an API for for you know using Linux as a hypervisor, and Libvert is an API for using that in a more user more, more programmer friendly way. I don't want to say user friendly. Um, it, or, well, actually, no. Once you use a front end like Vert Dash Manager, it's you don't have to be a programmer. You can be a you can be a system in like me at that point. Um, and then Overt itself has its own APIs, giving you that extra layer of abstraction. So it is a APIs all the way down. Okay. So I told you guys that Overt is about doing things at scale. And uh, having different machines, all kinds of different machines on your network doing different things. 
comes down to these, these three main themes uh, that we're going to go through. So there's a management layer. So you have to have some machine or virtual machine somewhere uh, that runs the overt management stack, and it's called overt engine. And I think they used to make pretensions about overt engine possibly running on other offering systems. They've now dropped that. They've acknowledged you need to run it on, on CentOS or, or Red Hat. Uh, then uh, because one of the ideas with over is that you're going to be running multiple pieces of equipment, uh, in order to kind of have the ability to move virtual machines between equipment really easily, uh, a lot of people are going to end up using network-based storage. Uh, there is actually an option in Overt as well to use entirely localized storage, but this is sort of the, um, the kind of featured way to do it. Uh, and you need, you need the network storage to do things like uh, live virtual machine migration, where you can, have a vir one virtual, you can have multiple machines acting as hypervisors, and you have a virtual machine running on one, and because the storage is on a net some kind of network device, you can migrate the memory and the CPU context to another hypervisor and run the virtual machine over there. Uh, and then you don't, you're, you're only having to move the memory over, you don't have to move the whole entire storage environment over when your storage is on a network to begin with. That being said, when your storage is on a network, you really do have to care about performance. The one thing we've got going for us today is we're going to simulate a full multi-machine overt environment all on one laptop with a solid state drive. So, and so we're going to be getting relatively fast networking that way. But um, you probably, I, I think Adam did suffer from trying what, one gigabit, or did you did you just know right away, Adam, that you needed better than one gigabit? Uh, I, I spun it up on one gig uh, per second storage. Yeah. And actually, you can run prod on a one gig per second storage lane, mm -hmm. but you are all the storage is always going to be your bottleneck unless you're running pure number crunching apps and nothing else. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the cluster you inherited, I replaced it with a 10 gig point to point cable that we managed to sneak in by calling it an iSCSI cable. <laughs> <laughs> because we weren't allowed to connect 10 gig networks without going through the networking department. And I was like, no, I want it to go point to point, so it was an iSCSI cable. <laughs> yeah. As it turns out, we were uh, we were actually running NFS over IP as opposed to iSCSI over IP. Or whatever it was, yeah. <laughs> well, iSCSI would have sounded more network-attached storagey, even though NFS is just as network-attached storagey yeah. at the end of the day. What did I actually leave it as, NFS or iSCSI? It's NFS. I left it as NFS? Okay. Yeah. And, uh, okay, the third sort of component of the system is uh, having having computers that you're probably loading with lots of RAM and a decent CPU where the actual execution of all your virtual machines take place. And uh, if you don't want to overheat the world, better to have a, some a small number of machines with lots of RAM than uh, lots of small ones uh, if you're doing normal computing, which is RAM intensive, not CPU intensive. So that's the way to go, go for density. Uh, and so to do our hypervisor uh, component, uh, there is a way that you can do a standard CentOS or Red Hat um, installation and then enhance it to become an overt node or hypervisor or host. These words, I'm going to use these words interchangeably, but uh, the really nice way to do it is they actually have uh, almost an, an appliance-like system where it's, uh, it's a standard CentOS Red Hat installer, but it just sets, you right, it sets everything up right away to be uh, to be a virtualization node or hypervisor. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't have any additional stuff going on. So that's what we're going to be using in our, in our demo today. All right, so we are now going to rely on some screenshots. But I'm going to just do a quick review of what the setup here looks like. So I don't, legibility is probably not great there. I'm just going to point and read. What, what can I do? Right, I'm getting magnifying stuff. Okay, so oh, this is vert dash manager. So common and easy to get libvirt stack. Key thing to know is I've got these three three different networks set up, uh, and the reason I'm doing network network segmentation here is because 
the um, well, first of all, we're going to do network storage that, generally speaking, network storage is going to be, even with your best efforts, might be configured insecurely anyways. I'm doing it really insecurely, so it's like, okay, well, at least put it on a dedicated network. So that's why I have one network that's just our storage network, but we're only going to have uh, network file system NFS traffic going on. We're not going to have anything else going on. And I didn't even configure this one to have an internet address on the host system, my laptop. It's... Uh, it's entirely isolated. And then the other network I have is uh, for all the three different components I just went through there, management, storage, and hypervisor, uh, all of them have their own kind of management interface. And you don't want these man management interfaces on the public internet because these are massive web apps written in, I think, mostly Java, maybe some Python. So uh, they're for your eyes only, so put them on a management network. And then our third network will be what our actual virtual machines themselves will consume. Uh, so this one for just the virtual machines, uh, I'm calling that 192.168.99.0 slash 24. I don't have any whiteboard space. Oh well. And the management one will be 90.0 slash 24. And the storage one will be, you can't see it here because I don't even have it on the host operating system. That one will be 95. So I don't have any monomics for you guys for 90, 95, and 99. But that's, that's how they break down. Oh, I should bring this online. Okay. So I've got three virtual machines here corresponding to the, the three components we're talking about here. So let's go through this one first. This is a virtual machine running the overt management environment, or overt engine as it's called. And so I'm going to just walk you through how I got that one installed last night, last minute prep. I, and so, but hey, at least I'm not trying to install it over the internet here. And uh, so I've gone with lots of screenshots instead. And right now I don't even have them in my slide deck, but I'll get them all in the slide deck before we publish it, and that way you guys can have a full tour and you'll, your eyes will survive the fact that this isn't really readable. Um, I can do some zooming in this screenshot as well. Okay, so I did just a standard 64-bit CentOS install. Uh, we speak Canadian English here. And then there's, um, for setup screen, And there's the virtual disk that I gave for this management environment. And I said, you know what, I don't want whatever weird partitioning scheme Red Hat's going to do, so I customized it. And I really just, all I really needed to run the management environment was just one partition. I don't even need a boot partition. And I changed the default uh, XFS file system, the ext 4 just because I'm more comfortable with ext4 in terms of experience, I don't think there's anything wrong with XFS. Um, but that's that. So that's partitioning. Oh, and there's a little warning at the bottom here. Screenshot is actually not filling the screen. Um, it's warning. I didn't do swap. I don't care. I'm going to make sure the virtual machine itself has has enough memory. They do say it should have. Uh, the recommended to run the management layer is 16 gigabytes. Well, and that's all I've got on this laptop. I got away with considerably less. I did my install, I believe, with eight. And then after I had it all set up, I brought it down to four to make room for the other parts of the environment. So it was just warning me about lack of swamp. But there we go. There's our summary. All right. And then there's networking. So our management... Virtual, our management system only needs to be on our management network, so I only gave it uh, one virtual Ethernet card uh, that's on that network. So anyway, so when I configured it, uh, I made sure it could be connected to auto, it would connect automatically. Because uh, that's the one thing about Red Hat and uh, CentOS is it the system doesn't do tries to avoid doing things like surprising you with a network. Like surprising you with a DHCP request on a network where you don't intend it to, you have to explicitly say, hey, it's okay, do it that way. Uh, and to keep my setup simple here, I actually did uh, a static setup. Even though 
if we go back up to my Ubuntu libvirt stack, I did have I did have GHCP enabled on this management network, but uh, I don't want to rely on that being consistent. So I did a static config. So this gateway and DNS server address, that's that's the host OS, Ubuntu host OS on my laptop. So the, my made my laptop dot ninety dot one and our management thing is ninety dot two. All right, turned it on, and I gave it a host name. So the one thing about over it is it is picky about it actually wants you to have a proper DNS setup where your forward DNS request that's a name to an IP address and your reverse requests from an IP address to a name are consistent. But if you're playing with this as a hobbyist, there is a way around that. Um, you just have to maintain uh, Etsy host files. Though it can get, that can get out of hand pretty quickly. So you may have to invest in learning how to have something else on your network run DNS for you so that you can have forward and reverse DNS. And one minor mistake I made here that the software complained about later, but I, I managed to survive that, was I, I probably should have given this uh, host name a at least two components, you know, mug dash over manager dot mug or something. So I did use dot mug on my other ones. But I did get away with that. All right, that's the end of the, I clicked begin installation. Uh, uh, CentOS installer has you set a root password while everything else happens in the background. And then we, I was done. Uh, and there's my first screen after boot. I didn't even kept get a screen grab of the bootloader. I thought I did. Anyways, uh, I can see that, that is barely staying on screen. Oh, because I scrolled. And here, I can actually... Now I, Zoom makes a little more sense. Give everyone a little more visibility. Oops. All right. So I got a login prompt after it came up. I logged into it. And I immediately got to work setting up overt. So this command here, let me just get out of full screen. All right. So this was uh, this was straight out of the docs off the Overt website. Um, I'm a little perturbed that this was that they made this an HTTP request pulling uh, one RPM and then. Uh, Installing it that way, but yeah, the basic idea of this uh, Red Hat package that's being installed here is it it sets up all the other repositories that you're going to need to install over it because you can't just install it from a plain CentOS installation. You have to uh, you have to add a bunch of repositories, but uh, all the software is coming from Red Hat maintained folks these days. I'll just go back to All right, and there's the, uh, are you sure you want to install that prompt? And there's, there's that succeeding. All right. So next was, this is the one thing that bugs me about Red Hat environments compared to Debian environments. They have a command update that mixes uh, updating your package manager in terms of which uh, uh, what, what, and updating its copy of the repository database and then there's uh, actually updating your packages they do that in with yum all in one thing maybe there's a way around that I'll leave it to someone else's presentation uh, and I just threw the dash y in there to uh, uh, to just a I, I'm going to say yes to the upcoming prompt anyway. Are you sure you want to update a bunch of stuff? As it turns out, I used a CentOS 7 uh, install that had a uh, installer disk that was out of date. Probably so. It was a uh, it was a decent amount of downloading, uh, but it wasn't too bad. Even though I had the cheapest connection, Shaw will will sell you uh, 15 megabit, 15 gigabit. No. No, it's megabit down. <laughs> sounded too, sounded too slow to be true, but it's actually it was actually fine. It wasn't bad. Yeah. All right, and then because uh, I started with an ancient CentOS install, 
uh, I followed the guidelines as well. If that update did a kernel update, just uh, reboot to that right away. Don't even, don't even try. Okay, so I came up from reboot and I decided it was time for me to take care of, uh, of my DNS setup. So uh, I looked at what was already in Etsy hosts. Um, so this is the alternative to running a DNS server. You could have all your different servers have IP addresses and names mapped together in an Etsy host file, but you have to keep them all consistent. Um, and instead of using a text editor, I just echoed the string I wanted and I appended it to the file and then this was what it looked like after. Is that, is that this zoom? Is that readable? That's all fine. That's fine. There we go. All right. And then here's the actual magical command that's going to turn this installation into uh, overt management with overt engine. And there's a lot to install. So there's the summary. Uh, it'll be 1.2 gigs when it's all unpacked. And remark, this didn't take too long on my really slow shock connection either. But I was tired, so who knows? I may have been just dreamy as the time passed by here. Probably, probably got up and got a drink or something. All right, so pro sc progress screenshot, 364 packages. Uh, and then there was a bunch of GPG keys to validate. I didn't just yes these. I actually went to centos.org slash keys to validate them with HTTPS, uh, which is not the best way to do it. The ideal way to do it would be to have yourself well connected in the world of GPG and uh, find a pathway through the GPG web of trust. That's, and uh, if anyone wants to get hooked up with that, uh, you've noticed my first slide, I did have my GPG keys up there. And thanks to our lovely ha hackerspace, Skullspace, I've actually gotten uh, decently well connected. If, if you go to markjenkins.ca slash GPG, you can actually see some examples of uh, celebrities that I'm, internet celebrities who use GPG. Yeah, no one, no one, no A-lister, world-class A-listers, but uh, few people who are famous in the, the tech world uh, who have GPG keys, and I'm like six hops, uh, five hops from a bunch of them, so that's cool. But I didn't, I didn't quite do it that way, but I did val I did actually read off these uh, fingerprints on the um, CentOS website. Okay, so yes, 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 yes. And then stuff installed. And then it was done. And is this a blank screenshot? This looks like it's a blank screenshot. Maybe I was trying to capture the bootloader or something. Or just progress during engine install. Anyways. Oh yeah, well I was probably trying to capture the... Oh, there it is actually, just in the corner. Right, because I was always popping these to the top. Okay, so once you have over dash engine installed, you can then set it up simply with just engine dash setup. And there's lots of questions. Uh, and you can just uh, take all your de the defaults and you'll be ready to roll uh, until you want to get more, more advanced. I did say no to this one because I think this is about like installing things from internet-based repositories instead of CD images and stuff that you get remotely, so I didn't bother with that. But everything else I just said yes to, and you could have just said yes to this one as well, really. Okay, so lots of yeses. You can do your homework on what these things are all about. Um, oh, and here's where I get yelled at for having this host name not having t at least two components, like mug-over-mgr.mug would have been better. Um, but I think it would have yelled at me worse if I didn't have that Etsy host entry to give it a, a proper reverse. Okay, so there's the the sky is falling DNS wise message, but it, moved, it goes on. Life goes on. Yeah, they have data warehousing in Overt, like you can do all kinds of analytics as to how your different, uh, how your different uh, hypervisors are performing and how your virtual machines are performing and all that stuff. Not something I've gotten into, so it's all just yes, yes, yes. Oh, and then there's the engine database. Uh, that's uh, Postgres, uh, which I think will make, it's Adam who will be happy. You gave the Postgres presentation. 
I'm sorry, your name is coming up a lot today. I'm calling you. Uh, and so you can actually, uh, if you have your own Postgres set up, and uh, everything that's critical about your overt setup will be in the Postgres database, uh, all your metadata about how the configuration of all your VMs. So if you want to get fancy, you could run your own Postgres cluster, or maybe you already are, and then you and back it up how, how you're already backing it up and not have to have this install one for you. But if you want this to install a Postgres for you, it just does it. So yes, just give me a Postgres. And this is about storage stuff. Uh, and this is all about um, doing um, whether you want to actually get uh, your public public key for the management web-based management interface, like whether you want to get a uh, certificate set up. But it does just, if you just tap through, it'll self-sign one, and it's easy to self-validate it. We will see that. Um, and they even have a setting here about if you're not following the advice, which is only use your, where you install the management environment, only use it for the management environment. Don't use it for anything else. If you don't follow that advice, um, and you actually are running other web apps there, then I guess you might want to say no to this question. Do you want, do you want the management app to be your default uh, when you just have the, um, when you just pop the address of your management server into the web browser, right? Because then it immediately redirects to slash over to engine or something. All right, and uh, yes, yes, yes. More data warehousing and a summary. All of this just by saying yes. Just hitting enter, take the default. You're good to go. There we go. Stuff is installing. We're getting Postgres. Firewall rules are being setting up, set up. It's all happening. And that was, and it's done. And then, that yeah, was weird. There was a bit of, uh, I barely got a working screenshot on this one. Oh yeah, and there's the complaint uh, that I've run. I ran this with less than the recommended 16 gigs of RAM for management, but I was fine on, I think this was the point where I ceased using eight and I dropped it down to four because I only got 16 on this laptop. And you're probably gonna be better off uh, if you're gonna simulate this all in one workstation to have a workstation that's more than 16 gigabytes. You know, you are, you are simulating an enterprise environment. So your uh, one gigabyte laptop acquired five years ago uh, for $300 just isn't gonna cut it. Adam. I'm going to have to take off. If anybody has any gear co-located at less.net, uh, the facility is currently without power. Uh, I'm going to head over there in the hopes that we have power by the time I'm there so I can turn the mug server back on. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't power on on... Well, it powers elements. on automatically, yeah. but it's a Debian server that got upgraded oh, yeah. from Jesse to Stretch or something yeah, like yeah. that. And the two 10 gig interfaces are in a bond group, LCP yeah. bond group. Yeah. And the LACP is configured as up, but for whatever stupid ass reason, Debian, is it Jesse is the current one? No, that's or Debian 8. Yeah, Stretch is Debian, Debian 9. Okay, the, the current Debian 8 in its scripts, I have config up the bond group, but they don't, I have config up the member interfaces. Oh, yeah. So we're up. Oh, okay. We have no connectivity. So what I've, I, what I've found with, um, a similar situation where you have a bridge and you have a network interface as a member of the bridge is if you or in your Etsy network interfaces if you put a um, uh, if you just put an entry that says uh, type, network type manual mm -hmm. for the um, other for the actual it is. raw network oh that's there and it's before the bond okay yeah um, <laughs> hence the WTFness of this particular problem huh interesting. It only happens when the thing loses power, yeah. which unfortunately has been, what, three times in recent history? Yeah. yeah. It's like, uh, way to enterprise rate data center, Wes. <laughs> yeah. So, probably taking off, sorry. The, uh, okay. So, um, if anyone's ever played on a sports team, your coach probably told you that you should you should practice like you're going to play. It's the same with, uh, or if you've been in a band, uh, you don't you want to actually like be simulating the real thing as much as possible. So in a production environment, if you're remote SSHing to machines, 
uh, and you have some kind of out of band uh, other than SSH way to get to that machine, uh, then you should really actually grab the SSH uh, public key hashes before you SSH in, so you can actually, when you get that prompt that says, hey, is this the right hash, and you get, the, you get something that looks like this, you can actually say yes, uh, not just once for guessing, but once because you validated it. So uh, I, uh, even though I'm building a simulation environment, and this is a network entirely contained within this laptop, I still sort of followed that practice. So post-installation, I got the ECDSA key, because that's the default with my Ubuntu installation when I connect. So that's how you get an ECDSA public key from the server you're logging into. And then uh, the other thing is the management interface. When we hit all those defaults, we got an HTTPS setup that was self-signed. So here is how you get the fingerprints for that self-signed certificate, web certificate. All right, and that is how we got our management interface installed. So when it's all said and done, you can you can then actually your management. That's when you're basically done with the command line on your on your management stack, and you're using this web interface or the API or the command line interface, uh, specialized command line interface. From there on, you don't have to. Um, you only have to go back to a root shell that like we were on if you're uh, upgrading it or something. Uh, so here we have, we're going to go in the administration portal, and somewhere along the line in that setup process, I, I think maybe a screenshot was missing for that, I did set up, this, this password here, it, uh, it is, it's for this web interface, it's distinct from the root, root password on that server. All right, now we're logged in. So we get a nice fancy dashboard with a whole bunch of stuff in the realm of computing and network and storage and administration. And we're not going to go through all of these things. Uh, well, we're gonna, we will see some of this as we set up the subsequent components. OK, so next up, we will set up the hypervisor. So time for a new set of screenshots. Okay, so I don't. Instead of looking at this with a screenshot, I'm gonna just actually look at it on the real thing here. Okay, so this virtual machine is running our management stack. This virtual machine is going is running our 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 overt node uh, hypervisor stack. And so the way I set it up. Uh, I have it present on all three networks. So this one is management. This one is for accessing the storage, and this and this one is for where the where, what will actually be passed through to the virtual machines for their for their use. And the big thing to note here is uh, you definitely have to get your drive size correctly to have the installer not freak out. So it doesn't actually take 60 gigabytes, but uh, the 45 they recommend, or 60 that I did, um, will at least keep the installer happen because it's putting in certain contingencies for the future. So um, don't worry about actually taking up that much space. And here's the critical part. So this is the virtual machine It runs on my laptop's host operating system, and inside it we're going to run overt managed virtual machines. So this is where the nested KVM aspect is going to be needed. And we could actually, and we could actually run multiple of these. Like I called it Hyper 1 because time permitting I was going to have Mug Hyper 1 and Mug Hyper 2, and I was going to show you guys live migrating a virtual machine and all that jazz, but do not have time for that. So uh, in order to have nested KVM work, Work. You also have to you have to set up your uh, you have to set up your outer virtual machine correctly. So if you just use this setting here, copy host CPU configuration, that will um, that will ensure the nested KVM is passed through. 
Okay. There we go. So the overt node installer that just is sets things up ready to go to be a uh, hypervisor. You'll see it, this looks suspiciously like a CentOS installer. It is a CentOS installer. It just has the overt branding in it. Uh, and similar if you actually get the, if you get this from Red Hat with a support contract and they brand it as Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, uh, or sorry, Red Hat Virtualization, they dropped the word enterprise at a certain point. Um, we'll see if IBM brings that back. <laughs> Um, you know, it'll have the Red Hat branding in here, and it'll be a Red Hat, Red Hat installer. Okay, so we speak Canadian English here, and uh, my slides are out of order. That's the, that's the boot prompt when we start it. This is what's supposed to come next. Uh, and I didn't take quite as many screenshots this time, because I don't need to show you guys a detailed walkthrough through a CentOS install. CentOS install the same again. <coughs> okay, so I made this one... Uh, 90.3, uh, remembering that the management one is 90.2, so they may be on the same network, and that's necessary. Okay. So yeah, labeled the networking, and this time I took their automatic partitioning because with this overt note they do real, really fancy stuff with logical volume manager uh, to actually do um, upgrades that are actually almost like an entire image like they bring it in as a logical volume a whole new image and then you reboot to it um, and so I just took their scheme as it came here and that was that um, again same thing password in the uh, while the install's happening, and then we're done. Okay, so I logged in. These are out of order, too. What do you know? Um, okay, so this is what its scrub uh, setup looks like, the bootloader. And, um, oh, and this is me on the management thing, the first uh, machine we walked through. This is me making sure the management system uh, knows about the uh, the IP address and host name we gave to the hypervisor. So again, I just popped into Etsy Hosts with a with an echo and an append instead of using a text editor. Okay. Uh, and here's me logging into the hypervisor, and it advertises how it has its management interface. It has its own management interface at port ninety ninety. Cool thing is, we never actually need to use the management interface uh, on uh, on the hypervisors themselves. We can actually have the the mat. What we're going to do here in the upcoming screenshots is we're going to have the management system. We're going to give it what it needs to log in to the hypervisor and just take it over and, and take over configuring it. So we don't actually need to use this and even look at this. But there is, there is a separate management console for your actual individual hypervisor machines, and that's what that is. Okay, so because um, not only I'm not actually planning to SSH into the hypervisor, I'm going to let the management layer manage it. But the way the management layer is going to do that is via SSH. So it's nice to know that they didn't reinvent the wheel. They're using a nice secure protocol to, uh, to have these kind of communications. So um, that's why actually this time I needed to get the uh, the RSA uh, public key from the hypervisor because uh, I actually validate that when we set it up in the management layer. Oh, and I did okay. I did log into it with SSH uh, at least one time, a few times actually. Now to think about it, uh, okay. So. Uh, who's ever tried to set up public key authentication on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux system using um, uh, SE Linux before? And who, who's ever had difficulty with that because of SE Linux? Okay, so here's my how-to to not get in trouble with that. Um, so SSH keygen on its own generates a key pair. 
Now, we don't actually need a key pair on the hypervisor for it to interact with the rest of the world. But the reason I run SSH keygen here is because it takes care of setting up roots.ssh directory correctly with all the things that are going to be needed uh, to remain SE Linux uh, compliant. So um, it sets up the permissions correctly. So only the owner has permission on the dot, uh, on the slash root dot SSH directory. And I use dash capital Z here to illustrate the SE Linux attributes are all good. So you'll see they put, um, I think this is the really critical one here, SSH underscore home T is the, uh, is the SE Linux attribute. I don't know the right terminology for SE Linux, but uh, that's the right secret sauce for a .SSH directory on an SE Linux uh, system that's uh, like Red Hat Enterprise Linux that ships with it by default. Okay, so we get our .SSH directory set up correctly. And then I create a authorized keys file in, dot, uh, in slash root .SSH. And right away, that file also in, uh, inherits this proper SE Linux attribute that it needs, SSH underscore home T. And, uh, and I know it's going to, our authorized key file is also going to need to be owner permissions only and not anyone else. And um, this was... Uh, this was me. Oh yeah, I was already in slash root dot ssh, and I was gonna then write um, for testing. I was gonna put the public key from the host OS on my laptop from my account in dot ssh authorized key so that I could ssh in with public key off. But yeah, I got the path wrong because I was already in dot ssh, and here I had dot ssh redundantly. So all I had to do was cat append authorized keys. Okay. So, back to the management interface. Uh, we're going to rely on screenshots here. So, uh, this screenshot is out of order. Oh, because I think I have to... Oh, this was the screenshot. Uh, the screenshot went wrong. Okay, I'm going to show what that screen ought to look like because it's actually a key point here. So initially, after installing that dedicated hypervisor, uh, this list here of hosts, that's what they call them in, in Overt, your computers that are going to run your host, your virtual machines, uh, this list of them would have been empty. So I would have clicked on New, and I would have said, oops, See, this is a pop-up that is CSS generated. What could possibly go wrong, right? Let's do this. Oh, come on. Let's just close it, try again. New, here we go. Okay. So here I would have said mug hyper one. And I would have said mug hyper one dot mug and then uh, I don't like using passwords to connect one machine to another because then is that going to stick around and these are robust so it's nice to use SSH public key authentication so they have that set up <coughs> so this is the public key uh, that the management side has that it needs to log into the hypervisor. So I would have copy pasted this into authorized keys on mug dash hyper one here. And I would have taken the opportunity to validate the hypervisor's uh, host public key that we looked up earlier. So there we go. We connected management and hypervisor together with. Uh, we connected them together with uh, public key off. Is this actually is this the real thing here? Do you know? 
I'm going to just check that everything's up and running here. Okay. So that's our hypervisor layer. Now we do storage. Um, we need network storage if we're building a big complex multi-machine environment. So this is what success would have looked like after adding the host. Okay. More screenshots. Okay, so who's used uh, FreeNAS before? All right, so uh, by no means do you need to use FreeNAS to set as the only way to set up network storage. I'm just use, I don't even use it much myself, but I figured it was a really friendly example that I could show of, hey, how to set up uh, network storage. And my inexperience with it almost kind of caught me a little bit, but I survived. So let's take a look at that. Storage, FreeNAS. All right, so uh, this is a screen early on in the FreeNAS installer. I have two virtual drives that I attach to my FreeNAS system. And here I'll give you the context on that. Here's my list of virtual machines that are on my laptop. So the third one is mug-freenas. And I've got, so you can simulate, you know, you can simulate FreeNAS having lots of different hard drives attached to it. Um, and you can, um, yeah, I've got it on our management network. And I've got it on our storage network. Because uh, that's what it's going to be providing. So back to the screenshots. Okay, so I attached two virtual hard drives to it initially with the idea being one is going to run my... Um, it's just going to run the FreeNAS operating system. And believe it or not, that's actually the first one, because uh, that's the question here, which is the uh, operating system going to be on. You would think that my the hard drive I was going to put the operating system on would be the smaller one, and that my actual set of storage drives would be bigger. But uh, this is an illusion. I'm using, I'm using a kind of disk image that only takes up uh, the actual space that's written to it. Uh, so I'm not actually using 20 gigabytes of space here to get the OS install in. Uh, whereas this 15 gigs that I'm later going to use to actually back the storage that FreeNAS is going to put out over the network, uh, to maximize my performance, I actually made that a dedicated block device from my host system, pass through directly to the um, to my FreeNAS VM so that there wouldn't be the layer in there of uh, of the hypervisor having to take take data from the VM and writing it to a specific file format on a file system and then there's a block level below that, right? So this 15 gigs is actually bigger in the sense that um, it's actually dedicated space and the 20 gigs here, I actually don't even have that on my, on my host system. It's all fakery. All right, so... FreeNAS succeeded, so it's really easy to install. And uh, it doesn't automatically reboot. It gives you a choice of what to do after the install. There we go. There's the, there's the FreeNAS bootloader. And uh, I got caught up by it uh, trying to uh, figure out which of my two networks to go on. So maybe I should have just started with one network uh, for management, set that up, and then brought it up for the other one because it was still kind of in its uh, setup phase when I booted it up. So that kind of caught me, that cost me a few minutes sort of sitting there saying, well, when are you going to decide which network to use? Because it was like trying to do DHCP on my storage network where I don't have any DHCP. I have that entirely isolated and not, and not uh, going through the host operating system at all. So that hung for a whole bunch of time there. Uh, and then this is FreeNAS's initial... Uh, um, this screen actually always appears uh, when you boot up FreeNAS and you're, you're looking at the console, uh, letting you configure a few different things. So I did networking, and uh, 
and I did a static config again. Okay, so it's on the management network as 90.4 because FreeNAS has a web-based management interface as well. So in the end, we end up with three different, all three parts of our stack here, management, storage, hypervisor, all of them end up with a web-based management interface uh, that you want to keep off the public internet. And so that's why we have that in the management network. All right. Um, and that was just setting up the IP address. I then still had to do uh, DNS and... DNS and uh, static route. Uh, where did the static route go? Anyway, the screenshot's missing. And then here's what FreeNAS looks like. Um, this is what the web interface looks like when it, when it comes up. Okay, so I went into FreeNAS and uh, I started setting up the second network interface that's going to be storage only. So that one's uh, that network's going to be 95.0 slash 24. So um, because FreeNAS is going to be the sort of key thing of that, providing our network storage, that's why I gave it dot .1, because there's no, I had that network completely isolated, I didn't even have a router or anything present on it, so that's why it took over the, why I chose to give it the, the first address. All right, and then, uh, and then we actually set up uh, some storage. It's uh, all ZFS based, just click, click, click. So, uh, yeah, I clicked on that add button there in the corner and got this screen here um, where I would have clicked on this stuff was grayed out at first. What did I click on to make things happen? Oh, I think there was, oh yeah, there was a button up here, suggest layout. So there was only one additional disk available actually set up as a dedicated storage pool that uh, that 15 gigs I was shown earlier that's actually dedicated block storage on my host system because I need it to perform as well as possible. So yeah, all I did was click suggest layout, just kind of grayed out there because I already did it. And then I said create. And then I said create pool, confirm. And yay, I had it myself, a uh, ZFS uh, storage pool based on one hard drive. Of course, in a production environment, you're going to want to, you know, ZFS is you're going to get more out of it uh, using uh, multiple hard drives. That's a whole other mug presentation that's already happened. Uh, okay, so this is network sharing. So we have a, we have some storage now. We have to figure out how we're going to put it on the network. So we're using NFS for the purpose of this demo. Uh, there is iSCSI in here as well, which also works with uh, Overt, but uh, it's a little more involved on both ends. So if you're really just dipping your toes, go with NFS. And here we go. Uh, this is the NFS setup wizard. And I went into the, is the button visible here? There was an advanced setting button that I clicked on that would have given me more of this stuff at the bottom. Because uh, one thing I wanted to do that I thought was really important, or I'll just say the first thing I had to do was actually select uh, that storage path where I set up that 15 gigabyte drive uh, to be what this NFS share is going to be based on. So that's the path selection. This checkbox is all about whether the NFS client that's doing the mounting has to actually use this path slash MNT NFS pool or whether it can actually mount a deeper path. So I actually didn't need to check that, I don't think. Uh, but yeah. Ten we, minutes. We got ten minutes left. Ten All right. Minutes. So let's let's move faster. We gotta restrict our network storage uh, to just be our, on our storage network because FreeNAS here is gonna share that NFS stuff out by default everywhere. So that wouldn't that would be bad news. Okay, and that is an out of order screenshot. Oh, because I'm cycling them now at this point. Okay, so that's how we got storage set up. Except I made a mistake, and we'll see how I corrected that. Time to move. Okay, so this is back to the web interface for the management software, the overt dash engine. And what I went to here, I'm going to show the click through path. I went to compute, I went to hosts, 
um, cause what I now needed to do was con configure that, uh, that other virtual machine that has a hypervisor, the dedicated hypervisor stuff. This is the part where I get to use the management side, which is a completely different system. It's, it's owning that, that hypervisor and taking it over. And so I'm actually able to configure its networking. So I go compute host. This is the host. I go to network interfaces and set up host networks. And when I got there, it would have looked like would have looked like this. Oh wait, missing a screenshot. Oh well, here it would have looked like this. It's gonna freak out if I do that. Uh, initially, that hypervisor just had the management network. I had to add these other networks in. How I added them in was I had to define them in in networks here. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to go in that in detail, but when I post the slides, you'll see some more screenshots about that. So I'm going to keep us moving because we've got to actually install a virtual machine, which is inside of a virtual machine, which is all on here uh, before the 10 minutes is done, right? So movement time. Okay, so adding networks and then configuring our hypervisor, how it actually uses those different networks. So that's the storage. Uh, then it turns out I did some stuff wrong with the NFS. The uh, overt hypervisors are expecting um, they're expecting that that they don't actually use root permissions to write to the NFS share. They want uh, owned by uh, user eight thirty six and group thirty six. And the convention for those is username KVM group uh, VDSM. So I ended up having to set that all up in FreeNAS. This was all done in a hurry today at, here when I was at work. Um, so, okay, so there's me adding in FreeNAS the user. There's also a screenshot somewhere in there of me adding the group. And this is the key part, user ID 36. Uh, I think I ended up using the command line in FreeNAS to to actually change the ownership of that directory that's being shared out. But it turns out there is a way to do that in the FreeNAS GUI as well. That's an exercise reader because time is running down. Here we go, heading for, the, heading for the finish line. Oh yeah, well there's me doing it in the command line. Uh, but yeah, here's the critical part, storage domains. Okay, so I added that storage domain, uh, FreeNAS NFS. Uh, I also added a different storage domain. And there was a whole process I went through that. I don't have time to review. Uh, for um, Dedicated for just serving um, CD images, ISOs, the, that I use during install. So that's something to, that's exercise to reader. So let's, uh, oh yeah. Well, this is what the add a storage domain uh, screen looks like. So this is where I referred to the FreeNAS NFS uh, uh, mount point and was able to set it up. Uh, well, this one's the ISO one, but similar setup. Okay, let's actually run a virtual machine. Another gotcha as well that I hit here. Compute clusters. So the idea of a cluster in overt is that you might have a different machines with different architectures. Even if they're all x86 machines, you might have some Intel machines and some AMD machines, and you might have some really old Intel machines and some really new Intel machines, and of course they keep adding new kinds of instructions, including instructions to help us deal with Spectre and Meltdown. So um, the idea of a cluster in Overt is uh, you set a baseline in terms of uh, CPU instructions that are available. Uh, and you, every host, every hypervisor that you put in that cluster has to meet that baseline. And then that allows you to do live migration of virtual machines because you can't live migrate a virtual machine to a completely different piece of hardware, especially going in the direction of, say, a new Intel machine with you know, advanced AES instructions to a really old one. So I got in a lot of trouble because when this guest did some guessing about my CPU type, I think it got it wrong. So I went to all and I had the crashes in the middle of installs and stuff. So I got myself out of trouble when I pushed it. I, I just went as far back as I could in terms of Intel CPU compatibility. So um, I think Penrims, I, I actually still have a few I'm managing uh, here. The, they might go back to 2010 or something like that. 
uh, anyways, that got me out of trouble. And so we can actually do a very quick, at least booting a, booting a virtual machine. So compute virtual machines. Um, instead of, because we're so low on time, I won't even run through an install. One thing that's nice for install is you do like run once. There's a whole process in here for attaching your networks, attaching your disks. And, but yeah, at the end of the day, run. Okay, and if you have that vert dash, there's different ways to set up the, um, how you do the remote graphics to your virtual machine. Uh, if you have it set up right, like with a vert dash viewer program, you can just click console with these defaults and I get a prompt. So what happened there was there was a file download. It has credentials that are only gonna work for 30 seconds or something. Uh, and it launches this uh, vert dash viewer program. So there we go, there we have a Debian virtual machine that I installed in the uh, dying minutes of the six o'clock hour uh, after I was dealing with crashes. So yeah, the, ne the nesting is happening here. This Debian virtual machine is living inside a overt node, hypervisor node, which is itself a virtual machine on my laptop's Ubuntu-based system. So there, with nesting, you can try out a really complicated stack like Overt. I think it is time for me to say, oh, we're freezing up here as we head for, head for full screen. Uh, yeah, any, any time for questions? Yeah, questions? What about security? Can you overlay security on um, access behavior? Yeah, okay, yeah, yes, it does have um, the ability to set up different multiple users. And I, this is something I, I really want to explore actually for, I, it's a feature I haven't been using yet. I've just been logging in as admin and log, admitting all the virtual machines. Because even though the university here is a big employer, the library is actually like a small little unit with their, our own tech team in there. So I kind of have the run of the run of the place. And so I haven't really gone into that, like fine greening the permissions. But yes, there are fine greening permissions. And I look forward to learning about them and maybe giving another presentation on that someday. Because I want to use this at our hacker space, which I think drew Alex to the meeting today. Uh, and so there I very much want to have the idea of um, people can launch their own virtual machines and have certain resource limits and uh, but not mess with other people's uh, but maybe some administrators could mess with more. Troy. Yeah, uh, you alluded to live migration earlier. Yes. Is that part of uh, Overt itself or is that a lower, lower layer? Okay, so Linux and the stack of Linux, KVM, and Libvirt on its own does support live virtual machine migration, and uh, it's interesting people mentioned less on on today tonight's outage night because um, uh, apparently years ago after I showed him just a simple um, uh, KVM KVM and Libvirt stack, he did a live demo. It's I, it might even have been an interest group for telecom related to mug or something he did a live demo apparently of live migrating a vm running telecom software uh where he kept a call alive uh during a, a vm migration something like that it might you may even have had hold call music playing so um the other thing that exists is storage migration and um i've done that use i know that's a feature in Overt. I don't know if Overt is inheriting that entirely from Libvirt and, and KVM and Linux, or if it's just building on some building blocks that those have. But I have done live storage migration here uh, when I was doing maintenance on storage equipment. So there is live storage migration and live VM migration. How do you trigger the migration? Is it manual, or is you set it up to migrate away when you're yeah, no, you can have, you can have, um, uh, you can use the API to schedule migrations, and you can, all, the other thing that's sort of similar to migration, but not quite a migration, is you can do high availability. If a hypervisor drops out entirely, you could set things, you could set up virtual machines to automatically start on a different, restart on a different hypervisor. Um, as for features other than the API doing Rebalancing and stuff? I don't know if that's there. That's a good question. 
Now you said CentOS and Red Hat only. What about Fedora? I think I saw something on a web page just the other night saying no longer Fedora. Okay. Um, but but you if you're simulating it, or if you're the other thing you can kind of do with this kind of simulation is let's say you're using like consumer grade equipment that doesn't have out of band access, like a way to get a console without being there. So you can also use a nested KVM setup as a way to create another layer. Um, or if you're simulating, so yes, you could run Fedora in the same role that I was running Ubuntu here with just a libvirt setup and then run the overt node uh, inside of that. Okay. I think that's it for questions. So happy hacking. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark.